Hello and welcome back to You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we have Andy on, who is a financial analyst in the city. Hey Andy, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, just first of all, uh, who are you and what do you do? Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Um, as you know, I'm Andy and yeah, I'm a financial analyst, mostly specialising in um, analytics consultancy. Um, kind of means that I go into companies and look at their data, build models for them and try and get a good predictive algorithm out so they can use it to make money. So there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, is there, can you make that slightly simpler, do you reckon? Or, um, or what, what is it you do on a day-to-day -day basis, more or less then? A uh, day-to-day, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's to make it a bit simpler, it's more if a company is struggling to, let's say, take hold of their data and want to get a actionable kind of information from it, they would come to us as a consultant and we'll go in and either take their data and try and build a model or tell them how they could try and use it in the future. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I would just go in and I can mostly code. Um, and a lot of it is just trying to understand their data and find out errors within it, what can be used, what can't be used. So you're trying to pull out all the financial data within companies and set it out in a clear way so they can basically take action on it, whether that's buying things, selling things. Yeah, basically. Yeah, that's one of the best ways to explain it. It's just trying to get everything as crystal clear as you can. Mm -hmm. As a lot of time you get hired by one company and they want something, but they have to explain it to the higher ups. So you have to get everything to the tiniest detail. For them to so read. did you always know you wanted to do something like this? Are you quite techie, quite numbers orientated? Uh, no, no. Yeah. Um, after I was 18, I went to um, uni with Julie. In fact, um, I studied a civil engineering degree. I'm surprised you got through that. Julie was in the pub most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I was with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was an interesting three years. Um, I kind of got to uni and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I wanted something to do with math. Uh, civil engineering seemed like a fun way to kind of spend three years. Um, you yeah, got to the end of it and realised it wasn't for me. So I jumped over to a master's in finance and... Mostly just wanted to work in the city. So here I am in London, now working in finance. So it so, all worked out. <laughs> is, that the, is that the direct route into what you're doing? You, you have to have a degree or a master's within the finance sphere? No, I wouldn't say you have to have a master's in it. Um, I think it helped kind of with me to pinpoint how that I wanted to get into finance. Um, I think a big issue nowadays in the city is a lot of people just want to go into finance for money or it seems like a go-to job. And when they get to interviews, they have no real passion for it or real kind of reason why they want to do it. Um, I think what you really need is just the ability to kind of work semi-long hours, be able to crunch through numbers and get tasks done when they need to get done. Um, that's all you really need to be able to display. Where does your, your passion for, for numbers and, and that kind of um, that work come from? Because it, it's completely polar opposite for me. I, I couldn't do what you do. Uh, very impressed by it. But where, where does that come from? Yeah, I think I've always, um, always loved numbers from a young age. So I'm dyslexic and I always struggled massively with English and like languages. And uh, my spelling is atrocious. If you look at it now, I'm sure they wonder if it's a kid or an adult writing it <laughs> i'm on the same page as you mine is dreadful <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's, that's uh but i found the opposite for numbers so they just made sense you know when you look at something and you want to work out the answer and it all kind of just falls into place without much force yeah i mean andy i can obviously relate to that quite heavily i i'm very much in the same boat and obviously went to university and i do mechanical engineering um because it was this it was the same feeling for me um so after after you uh, were halfway through your master's degree, um, did you know that you wanted to go into the analytical side of uh, finances? Um, what what was the the sort of steps or things that happened at that point to you get for you to get started in it? Yeah, so I would, I knew I wanted to go into some form of analytics. So to halfway through my master's, I started writing my dissertation on option pricing. So I won't bore you the details. It's just quite a mathematical part of finance and I found it really interesting. Um, I went to a few job interviews in the city for it but after like six or seven rounds got a few offers but didn't like the companies. Um, 
so I ended up going back home and trying to find an area of finance which had a lot of math and quite a bit where I could learn and I fell within credit risk at a challenger bank um, so I worked there for a year before moving into consultancy. Did you find but, that quite a competitive uh, jobscape when you were looking? Yeah where when you're coming as a graduate um, I think it's super competitive in the city you have a lot of people wanting the same role you have um, and you need to kind of find a way of diversifying yourself even if it's just getting that one year's experience that I had after uni I would recommend to anyone who's looking to work in finance if they're at university now and are in their second year of like an undergrad or a third year of like a master's go get an internship for eight weeks it will help yeah. you out so much in the yeah, long that's, run. That's a lot of uh, a lot of previous podcast um, people have interviewed have given similar advice. But you also said that obviously you uh, went into the role not for uh, the finance uh, for the financial benefits of it, um, but because you had a passion for it. And do you think that was something that came through in your interviews and actually made you stand out compared to others? Yeah, I think definitely in my interview at a current firm, um, having the passion of data analytics and wanting to do it is what drove me i think you could do it if you had the passion for money but the biggest problem is you'll burn out very fast yeah i have mates in the city he jumped into investment banking and they work the 1800 hour weeks and if they don't have that passion for it within two three years you're dead or you feel dead because there's no there's nowhere to go really and you don't enjoy what you're doing whereas okay. the flip side if you enjoy it even though it might suck at times at least you can progress through it and know that you're having fun in a way. Is it is it the problem solving for you that that really sort of gets your your brain going? Yeah, yeah, I'd say yeah, it's it's finding that problem and finding the story behind all that kind of nicheness or chaos. We say so you, when you get data from a client, it's normally quite random or hard to see a trend. And I love just going into it and finding out all the small details and why things work. Okay. Um, I can assume it's uh, very much an office-based job or a desk-bound job. Um, but you've also spoken about going into companies. So as you've been a consultant, you are hired to go into other, uh, other companies to help them out. So do you actually travel a lot and actually go into these other businesses and sit down with them? Or do you have the, yeah. rest of the information come to you? So currently, as you imagine, we don't travel much. I've, yeah, I've sat in my that. house for the last uh, four months. Um, yeah. So as a consultant, I work in the EMEA region. So that's Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Okay. Um, and we have clients everywhere. So I have clients in the Nordics, out in Middle East, wherever you can imagine in that kind of area, we will have people. Um, and a lot of our job is when we first start working with a new client, we have to go out and visit them and we present to them how the model or how the project is going to go. So there's a lot of traveling. I'll say about 50% of my time is traveling. Oh, okay. And the more you work up through the company, the more um, traveling you should be expected to do. And does that is that uh, something that appeals to you quite a lot? Do you enjoy that? Yeah, I really enjoy traveling. Um, as Judy knows, uh, I grew up a little bit out in Asia during my summers. And yes. I think it's great to kind of experience different cultures. And it's one of the things that drew me to this role. But it's definitely more of a consulting thing that brings the travel. Yes. A neoclassical kind of finance side, you'd be more expected to say in the office from like nine to six or nine to five kind of day. Um, yeah, it's not it's not really normal to travel that much in the city. Going back a little bit, well, you, you sort of touched mm-hmm. on, um, you know, in, incredibly long hours and you have to have a sense of enjoyment. But I'd imagine yeah. it's quite a stressful job. How do you deal with that personally? Yeah, yeah. So the hours can be long, and then they can also be short sometimes. It's all around what you probably hear in most industries got the crunch, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's when you get towards the end of a project or a deadline, you're expected to kind of get that work done. And we're given a lot of flexibility in our company to work whenever you want in the day, but as long as your work gets done at some point, that's fine. And you just have to kind of buckle down and see it's only a short period of time. I think if it was consistent, that's when it's you get burnout that you see a lot in like investments mm. or in certain industry. Are you are you finding it that there's not a ton of micromanagement in what you're doing? You're giving a project and it's like run with it. You know, you need to do this. Yeah, I think one of the best skills you can kind of develop. I'm not sure how you would develop it in that situation, but it's the ability to get given something and just get going. Um, 
is a skill we're seeing between asking for help and doing something or just and not just being told every single step mm. yeah you, there's a lot you need... of trust given to us just to make sure that it's going so you need to have an uh, initiative basically yeah um so that that leads us nicely on to sort of talking about personality obviously you're you know you're really into your maths you're really into your problem solving what what kind of personality do you need for this role i think yeah there's the whole classical you need to be math and kind of problem solving to get it done but a lot of people come in for more like liberal degrees and i think it's it is kind of just trying to tackle problems from different angles is one of the best traits you can have and not giving up but if you can try it one way you can try another 30 ways and one of them will probably work in the end and I then the other oh, gone. Oh, sorry Andy, please carry on ah, go on thomas i was gonna say you've got um uh obviously you're traveling like 50 percent of your time as well so that's obviously quite taxing um both so that's just something you need to consider but also it's meeting so many people across the world and having to liaise and deal with those yeah. i suppose uh, is something you need to be able to uh, deal with quite well yeah that's where moving on to the other skill i think you need to have is you can be the most perfect problem solver and consulting or well, financial analytics and that consulting wouldn't suit you as you need to be able to go to people from different backgrounds and be able to like coerce or talk to them in like a normal matter and explain I find that one of the English ones is about to explain to them in a high level or like a low level, depending on where the background is mm. on what you're presenting. Um, you can see the most fantastic people from math go in, uh, but have no ability to explain what they're showing. Presentation skills, yeah. social skills, that's incredible. It's soft important. skills that yeah. a lot of people look over in the interviews and you don't realise how important they are. Mm. Okay. What what kind of um, are the main positives and opportunities you've taken from, from your role so far? I think the biggest positives is one of them has to be learning um working in project kind of format or working with multiple clients you're learning so much faster than you would if you just worked in one kind of like what I call like a neoclassical bank where you do one thing yep having twin i normally have like two or three projects on maybe more and you're learning different you're applying different models or different skills in each one so you're always coming and dragging different skills across them and then traveling i think is a really cool positive it opens to this like, whole world to you. Mm. So the traveling doesn't come as the negative for the indus- uh, thing in the industry in your eyes? Not currently. I okay. can imagine in time, if yeah. I like, settle down and have kids, a wife, it could be more of a pain to have to go off every so often. What are some of the uh, negatives that you find? So as we mentioned touched on earlier, the crunch can be a negative. It's something you can deal with, but when you're working with other clients and other people, you're kind of leaving everything into like their hand on when you get data. And then once you get data and you start modeling, everything speeds up and you can in the end just be working crazy hours for a short period of time, um, which can burn you out quite quickly. And you feel after the project's finished sometimes a bit knackered. No. So we're going to talk a little bit about money. We're just going to give you some rough average figures yeah. uh, salary wise um, and just say if they sort of sort uh, fit your understanding so starting this is quite a high starting salary job obviously because you're your graduates um, around 35 um, seems to be the starting figure and then to be honest with you the upper uh, upper reaches are there doesn't seem to be a ceiling on that yeah that's yeah i put that down in one of the uh, average yeah in my books are probably like a 30 to 45 is probably a base in wow. most areas um that is for the city um using uh, not just like outside of london that's where you probably have to like 10 grand off it mm-hmm. um but then you've got to take into account bonuses and how different like firms structure their bonus is is that quite a common everybody would be expected to get a bonus kind of thing yeah so a lot of companies will give you a kind of average figure and then you'll hear a lot in the industry some like total comps which takes into account like, your tuition fee reimbursements your wow. bonuses cars let's say anything like that so there's a lot so, of financial rewards uh, from this job yeah so at my company i get a certain not a portion of my salary i don't know how much it is but i get a, a few thousands for um a like tuition that i want to study so oh, if wow. i want to take a further qualification Any further degrees or anything yeah so things like frm for me or like the prm um things that they encourage you to take to further your qualifications in the industry and get a bit further 
mm. all costs like a few thousand pounds to do exams and they cover it for you so what would be something uh that was not on the job description when you first applied um that you have to deal with uh quite regularly that um is maybe not as not as favorable as you would like uh not as, not as favorable as i like i think maybe well, well, positive, I think, yeah maybe. i think about it for a second while i answer one of the things that i thought wasn't on the job description and that is kind of tackling problems um i meant i touched on it earlier but it's the whole point of not reinventing the wheel um if that makes sense so you don't want to be reinventing the wheel each time you're trying a problem you want to ask for help mm. but there's a, there's a very fine line of asking for help and not trying hard enough if that's yeah yeah um, if that makes sense to me yeah I can and that. i think it's a really tough task to learn and something you don't really see on any job pages of knowing your own personal limits on when you need help versus when you can ask for it as i've gone away in projects and worked 10 extra hours trying to solve a problem and then you can't fix it and you ask someone else and within two minutes it's they've done, done it for you yeah so if you spent two hours trying to do that, I would have learned the same amount I learned in those two that I learned in the 10. Yep. And that's when you're wasting good time, especially if you're building a client or if you're trying to fit in other project work. So I suppose another question um, is obviously, you've already said that these projects are quite uh, personal. They're obviously not given to you guys as teams. Um, so going to other colleagues or, and things like that, are how much of like um how much information gets fed down and are you taught on the job sort of thing yeah it's quite a lot of teaching on the job but um we are when you say personal it's personal more within teams with three or four okay. um so it isn't like individual you do have normally a project kind of lead and then a few analysts and like a reviewer and uh, that's a typical project in our structure um in other places you might have bigger teams but a lot, there's a lot of working within teams as you always move between types of jobs. Um, but yeah, I would have to say a lot of it is taught on the job. I find the best, and especially for me, it works for my learning style. I don't like reading books and just learning. I find you could read a textbook a few times and learn nearly nothing, but you put someone in the job for a week and they've learned everything they need to know. Well, 100% agree. But, yeah. I think practical learning and, and really getting stuck in and having someone there with you is, is the best way to learn, certainly for me. Um, so talking about being in the city, being in the finance world, what's the social life like? Uh, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, won't, I won't deny that. As a, Yeah, um, after work drinks on a Friday is pretty common. You don't have to drink, but like, it's quite quite wrong is that team building yeah really like good. after like friday five o'clock i'll go for a few pints and then meet some friends um it's pretty it's a pretty fun place to be i think when you're in your early 20s um mm. in your late 20s going into it uh and it's a great place to meet new people from different mm. industries and different like, i've met a lot of friends in london and they don't just work in finance they work at like different consulting firms law and you meet these just after work sometimes in a random bar that you're outside and you're chatting and you meet someone who you never really thought you met outside of the city. Mm. So how does somebody progress in your industry? Is it taking on bigger contracts with bigger name clients? How do you progress? Yeah, there's, the way that my company does it is different to how a lot of places are and that's done by merit. So the more that you can show that you've taking on more skills or you're able to handle more clients, then you get promoted. And it's a purely merit thing. There's nothing about how long you've been there for. But a lot of the city was down to just time spent in um in that role, which I find quite a bad way of doing it. So if you look at like a typical investment firm, you'd have your analyst one, analyst two, analyst three, and every year you just move up. And I think oh, that's really? quite a bad way of just taking off, just taking off like a list. Yeah, so you, it doesn't matter how good you are. You've just got to put the time in. Yeah, for a lot of the old school investments or hedge, should we say, that's, it's very down to, like, they say it's down to merit as well, but you see, if you've been there for two years, you'll be an analyst two, three, mm. analyst three, associate one after three or four, depending on how they structure it. I think that's quite common in the city. We, we had some guys on the other day um, from a sort of insurance background, and that's sort of the same kind of vibe. You've got to put the years in. Um, but I'm not sure whether that's the best yeah. way sometimes. Uh, if you're good at your job, you're good at your job. 
Yeah, so I think it's a terrible uh, way of structuring. Uh, people should be done purely on merit when they're ready mm. for it. Mm. And I don't know if that's as my company technically comes back from more of a software background, but we just deal with finance. Mm. Um, it might be more swung towards you having your skills allow you to progress. And that's I think that's way better than judging someone on what they can do. Okay. Um, so a question we generally like to wrap up with uh, is, would you go back into the industry if you started again? Uh, and an extra question for you, Andy, is would you do that civil engineering degree? <laughs> Yes and no. Yes and no. There's the two answers quickly. Yes, I'll get back into the industry if I can get back in time. Um, I think I'll probably try and go more into analytics straight away. Uh, being able to work with like machine learning, data, all those sort of things are now really interesting. And the industry is booming. Like yeah. analytics in the next few years is just going to continuously fly up. Um, and then civil engineering, no, I would probably do like comp sci if I could. So what's that? Sorry, Com, uh, compu um, computation is it? Okay. Or computer yeah, yeah. science yeah, yeah. or computer engineering? Yes. Something a uh, data coding. engineering. Something that has way more coding. So yep. something I've never really touched on in this interview is like a podcast. Um, is how much coding we have to do every day, and yeah. I've learned a lot of it on the job, and I'm really enjoying it now. But I met I meet new graduates who come from a comp backgrounds, and their coding yeah. skills are just yeah, phenomenal. They're building models in seconds and understanding it. And it's just crazy that the only reason I'm further ahead of them is that I have more credit knowledge or more finance knowledge. Yeah. And you just think in a few years' time, they're going to be blowing everyone up the water. Okay. Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Andy. Really enjoyed that. Yeah, really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. It's uh, been fun. Cheers. Thank Brilliant, you. Andy. Thanks, Andy. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye.